Reverend Jackson brought his crusade to register more than a quarter million black voters in the state to the campus of Alabama State University. On the last election, Reagan won the South with a coalition of rich people and unregistered blacks. Reverend Jackson asked those present who were 18 or older and not registered to vote to stand up and come forward. He then ushered several hundred students to the back of Dunn Arena to a table where registrars were waiting to sign them up to vote. The next stop was a luncheon meeting of black leaders from across Alabama. Reverend Jackson told black leaders the reason he's pushing for voter registration in the South is that the need for change is greatest in the South. If by November of next year we take registration seriously, we can have a net gain of 15 black congresspersons, a net loss of 15 bull weevils, and change the options for progressive whites. As long as blacks are unregistered, progressive whites have no future in Southern politics. During a news conference later, Reverend Jackson said he hadn't made up his mind if he'd be a candidate for the Democratic nomination for president in 1984. And it was on to the governor's mansion for a meeting with Governor George Wallace and other black leaders. Afterwards, Reverend Jackson told reporters that the meeting was significant because he and Governor Wallace were once on the He's opposite the ends of the political pole. And for us to have a summit meeting, to have a dialogue, uh, represents uh, the end of, of a no-talk policy. And when people talk, they act. And when they act, they can change things. Reverend Jackson is the scheduled speaker at a mass rally later tonight. Dennis Latham, WSFA-TV News. Reinvestment in this economy. In 1979, Barry Schallenberger took over a struggling Alabama baseball team. But in four short years, he's led them to a Southeastern Conference championship in their first trip to the NCAAs in 15 years. Well, I really think we can compete with most college baseball programs in the country. And uh, that's, that's been my goal, and I think we're right on schedule. Now, the big thing will be in the future whether we can maintain the same uh, caliber of baseball. I sure hope so. The next challenge for Alabama comes this Friday when the Crimson Tide opens play in the NCAA Southern Regional in Tallahassee. The opening day opponent is defending national champion Miami. I think if Miami's going to be a factor and we're going to be a factor in the tournament, we'd have to play them sooner or later. So just as well play them the first round and, and maybe the first game jitters would be affecting both teams and, and we're really looking forward to it. The Tide's mainstay this year has been hitting. With a team batting average of an incredible 341, you would think Schallenberger would consider hitting a key factor if Bama is to make it to Omaha in the College World Series. But not necessarily so. You know, that's a constant that we're real proud of. We swung the bat very well this year and uh, at, at most of the times, not, uh, not every game. But I really believe that the difference in the team is going to be our pitching. If we, can't, if we don't get any good pitching, it doesn't matter how good we swing the bat. Alabama will pitch ace Dean Hayes in the opener Friday with Miami. If the tie can win that one, they face the FSU South Alabama winner on Saturday. Whoever escapes the double elimination tournament will advance on to the 18 College World Series. Rick Ponds, WSFA TV Sports at the University of Alabama. You fight for years, you know, to have a horse for that. And then we had one we thought we could run good in it and then have this happen to us. It was very bad. What was your thinking of not putting him in the pregnancy? Well, he, he got uh, so strained and jacking him, pulled him up that his muscles uh, was tightened up on him and I just didn't want to take a chance with him because he's a fine horse and I just want to wait now till I think in August about the first time. I understand he is a late colt, so he's a very young three-year-old, yes, is that right? Yes, yes, yes. Does that mean that it's possible that he will mature and be a great stakes horse later on? Well, he, he could be, yes. I mean, I think the horse has got a great picture. One reason I'm not going to push you. Oh, yeah, sure. uh, he's out of one of the great mares of all time, Susan Girl. Uh, do you have a two-year-old by Susan Girl? No, uh, I give her a year off, and uh, we had two foals, four, four in a row with him, and I give her a year off, and I have a yearling. Uh, he's a by no devil, cost her 50000 to breed the mare to him, yes, and she has a a suckling by, if this be so, a horse, a secretary coat out of a uh, uh, Roman goddess who produced five stakes winners for him. So. so you're watching those kind of closely? Huh? Yes, yes. <laughs> so uh, no, you, the horse has been shipped to New York. No chance of the Belmont? No, no, he's not going to the Belmont, no. no. We what? just started back to gallop him slowly right now. You know, 
know, big money is later on in the year, really, a lot of big races. Where and will so, you take him? Well, I'll probably keep him back east or in New York and Fred time. We have uh, some horses in California that I uh, think we can do something good out there that yeah. once we have there. You, you like it, to run in California, don't you? Yes, I like it because uh, they have the right kind of money out there. <laughs> horses out there are easily double what they are in Miami. And, of course, New York has good purses, but uh, California has some great purses. They have no competition out there in California. You had a, oh, <laughs> you had a great year last year. How's it, how's it looking this year with the... Well, it doesn't look good right now, but... Seven congressmen from Alabama. Not one black. We want our share. Jackson says the only way blacks can get their share and make a change is to register to vote. The rally at the Lily Baptist Church came on the heels of a weekend shooting of a black man by a city police officer. Investigators say the man was drunk and scuffled with police who were trying to help him. The police officer who fired the fatal shot says she feared for her life. The incident marks a second time in two months that police shot an unarmed black man. Black state lawmaker says the shootings are just two of several recent incidents that prompted him to ask the president to declare martial law in the city. Local law enforcement authority has completely broken down. There's no respect for the safety of the lives and property of black citizens. A Montgomery City Councilman says the problem blacks have with the police department stems from the mayor's behave. office. We can make him behave if you turn out to vote. But if you don't get registered, and if you don't vote, we are all whistling Dixie. Freedom Freedom Black leaders say they want a positive response from the white business community. They say if they don't get it, then they'll initiate their own positive response. Don Phelps for NBC News, Montgomery, Alabama. In this country, recent election victories by black candidates have sparked new interest in voter registration. As David Hazinski reports from Montgomery, Alabama this morning, the drive is being led by civil rights activist Jesse Jackson. Amid the singing in a Southern Baptist church, the Reverend Jesse Jackson looked for voters. Jackson wants to get unregistered blacks in congregations like this to the polls. He feels they can become the new key in political races won by slim margins and the key to new black voting power. North Carolina, Reagan won by 39,000 votes. There are 505,000 unregistered blacks. We got the power. Many blacks have registered because Jackson has said he might be a presidential candidate himself. These students registered to vote after Jackson spoke in Alabama State University. He wants to register two million of the South's three million unregistered blacks. Jackson says he'll wait till August or September to decide if he'll run for president. Just the possibility that he might run resulted in a meeting with an old opponent, Governor George Wallace, who is encouraging presidential hopefuls to come to Alabama. Yes, it is sure glad to have in Alabama. This afternoon, Jackson will become the first black in modern times to speak to a joint session of the Alabama legislature. David Hazinski, NBC News, Montgomery, Alabama.
kind of trash. Well, he grabbed his muzzle and told him to stop. Postal officials have figured out a way to type, label, deliver, and stamp first-class mail by computer. They call it ECOM. It stands for Electronic Computer Originated Mail. Okay, let's assume that you're a, a typical small businessman that has a, a weekly or a monthly billing or ad campaign to get out. Rather than preparing the paper, uh, stuffing the envelopes, putting the stamps on, delivering it to the post office, what you would do is create your address list on computer, mm -hmm. uh, save that out with a message that you'd like to send, and uh, electronically transmit it to one of our sites. Ecom officials say the new electronic mail service is ideal for businesses. No longer will secretaries have to type, stuff, and stamp letters. All that's needed is a telephone computer hookup to one of 25 post offices nationwide. The closest one serving Montgomery is in Atlanta. What we're doing is creating additional first-class mail that is a very distinctive type of mail, and it is delivered in the normal way. Delivering mail the Ecom way is cost-effective. It costs 26 cents per one-page letter this way, compared to $7.21 the standard way, but either way, the letter still has to be delivered by the postman. Kim Davis, WSFA, TV Family, friends, and patients of Dr. Dynaman and his wife Judy gathered at a good Israel synagogue this afternoon to pay their last respects. Rabbi David Balenson eulogized the couple as loving and caring parents who were also concerned with their community. The rabbi told the congregation to take comfort in the fact that they knew the Dynamans for the short time they were in Montgomery and to be thankful for their contributions to the city. As the memorial service was taking place, investigators were sifting through the wreckage of the plane that claimed the couple's lives. Officials of the National Transportation Safety Board and the Federal Aviation Administration wouldn't speculate on what caused the plane to crash and say they probably won't know for months. The single engine beach craft Bonanza vanished from radar Sunday less than 20 miles east of Montgomery. Two other prominent Montgomerians, Mike and Gloria Galloway, were killed in the same crash. Memorial services for the Galloways are scheduled for 3.30 tomorrow afternoon at Leak Memory Chapel. Mac Carmack, WSFA TV News. For more than a month, the House has been passing more than a dozen revenue-raising measures the administration needs to make ends meet in its general fund and education budgets. Of a dozen enhancement ideas, two were dropped from the lineup, meaning the administration has to have the franchise tax bill that was debated in the House today. The franchise bill will mean an $8 million difference in making ends meet. House Ways and Means Committee Chairman Tom Coburn says his committee will take up the general fund budget tomorrow. He says he has two substitute versions for the committee to consider, one which will make only a few adjustments and will depend on the franchise tax passing. But Mr. Coburn says he also has a general fund budget version that cuts $8 million out should the franchise tax be killed. He says those cuts will be across the board and will specifically affect funding to non-state agencies. Members say the surfacing of the general fund budget means the House is ready to swap the general fund budget and the enhancements for the Constitution from the Senate, which could be finalized by the Senate in the next week or so. Then, many members say how quickly the House considers the Senate's Constitution depends on how quickly the Senate considers the House's general fund package, and vice versa. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA-TV News, at the Capitol. The House leadership is down to within one enhancement of getting what it considers needed to make ends meet in its general fund and education budgets. The last revenue-raising measure would bump the fee for franchise licenses and was almost killed last week, but the House leadership and the administration have had more than a week to talk to members. And today, the tide had changed. Suddenly, two-thirds of the House was in favor of the bill. The opposition, now waging an apparently losing battle, put up a little bit of a fight, but the House decided not to wait them out and adjourn before taking the final vote. 
Throughout the more than a month that the House has been passing 11 revenue enhancements, floor leaders have said the money-raising measures have had to be considered before the budgets themselves could be considered. Even though this last franchise tax bill hasn't been finalized, the House leadership is pressing ahead and plans to take up the general fund budget tomorrow in its Ways and Means Committee. The confidence of the House leadership will be seen when House Ways and Means Committee Chairman Tom Coburn is faced with offering his committee members one of two versions of the budget, either one reflecting a cut of $8 million that the franchise tax is expected to generate, or the version spending the tax money that the House has not yet approved. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA-TV News at the Capitol. Family, friends, and patients of Dr. Dynaman and his wife Judy gathered at a Gudith Israel synagogue this afternoon to pay their last respects. Rabbi David Balenson eulogized the couple as loving and caring parents who are also concerned with their community. The rabbi told the congregation to take comfort in the fact that they knew the Dynamans for the short time they were in Montgomery and to be thankful for their contributions to the city. As the memorial service was taking place, investigators were sifting through the wreckage of the plane that claimed the couple's lives. Officials of the National Transportation Safety Board and the Federal Aviation Administration wouldn't speculate on what caused the plane to crash and say they probably won't know for months. The single-engine Beechcraft Bonanza vanished from radar Sunday less than 20 miles east of Montgomery. Two other prominent Montgomerians, Mike and Gloria Galloway, were killed in the same crash. Memorial services for the Galloways is scheduled for 3.30 tomorrow afternoon at Leak Memory Chapel. Mayor Emery Fulmer told the council what he knows about the death of William Hargris, the man who was shot and killed Saturday night by female patrol officer Eula Oliver. The mayor thinks Officer Oliver should stay on administrative duty until the district attorney investigates. His opposition came from the usual corners. Go ahead and take off the street tonight, give her her paycheck, initiate administrative charges, find out what the evidence is, and let the chips fall wherever they may, irrespective of what Mr. Evans and the DA's office does about this matter. But Councilman Watkins sees a larger problem. He rolled off a list of bad incidents involving the police and the black community. It just represents a pattern of, of uh, general incompetency on the part of some officers and maybe just unfitness to be police officers. And now, you know, it's to the point now, you, you, when you get a call at 12 o'clock, you just know it's a call that somebody's been shot, somebody, something's happened. And this is draining us. It's draining the city, it's draining our patients. And somehow we gotta start looking at the people we're recruiting because we just have absolutely too many mistakes. And some of them we can't recall. But it's inflammatory remarks by people like yourselves that cause about 90% of the, of, the, uh, of the problem that we've got now. And then Mayor Farmer right, offered a soother for the wounds, an advisory breathe, council, a biracial committee that, that could exchange ideas. Councilman Watkins called it too little, too late, and grimly said, Montgomery is like a train without brakes, a train running out of control. Susan Silvernail, WSFA TV News. Is I think he has the experience in the Senate in the very areas that we need to go along with his personal characteristics to do what's got to be done for this country. The mere fact that he was a military hero oftentimes makes people overlook what he's been able to accomplish, not only in the political world and government service world, but in the business world. This is not the answer. It's just a step of precaution. It's the same thing of telling the child, I'll take candy from a stranger, making them aware. This is just one step of awareness. Okay. <laughs> While it's not a cure-all for child snatching, kidnapping, or runaways, these classified prints can help. Parents can take the prints to police and have them entered into the crime computer. If a runaway child is picked up in another state, his prints can be put into the computer and matched against all those entered. Or if a child's body is found and his prints are in the computer, then law enforcement officers could easily identify him. Can we get, can you put your thumb right there like this? Do you know why you're getting your fingerprints taken? Well, so if we get kidnapped, they'll know what our fingerprints look like. Is this fun? Does it hurt? No, it doesn't hurt, but it's really yucky. 
if the tragic accident happens to a parent that the child has run away or has been kidnapped, they'll have the information ready because once it happens, the mother or father can't think of the information that the boy has septalytic fits, he has a birthmark or things like that when they make the report. And this way, the information's there and they have taken a step. It could never happen to my child. That's an attitude a lot of parents have about the possibility of their children running away or being kidnapped, but they're wrong. It could happen. And if it does, these fingerprints could help police and parents locate their child and bring them back home safe and sound. Gina Gregory, WSFA TV News. dirty business. Putting ink all over your fingers and hands and rolling them on this paper doesn't solve the problem. But that problem is twofold. One, messy ink. And two, missing children. While these fingerprints can help police officers identify missing children, it's not a cure-all for kidnapping, child snatching, or runaways. This is not the answer. It's just a step of precaution. Ms. Lachman says parents can list any pertinent information about their children on these cards that might aid police officers in making identifications. It could never happen to my child. That's an attitude a lot of parents have about the possibility of their children running away or being kidnapped, but they're wrong. It could happen. And if it does, these fingerprints could help police and parents locate their child and bring them back home safe and sound. Gina Gregory, WSFA TV News. I know most of you If you have a computer or a word processor on site in your office, in your home, you can generate uh, electronic mail to one of our 25 computer sites around the country. What that means is that you can send the mail into one of our sites, and the sites will print it up as regular first class mail, which looks like this a very distinctive envelope. And at that point, it becomes mail in the mail stream. The 2 o'clock scheduled joint session was somewhat late in getting started, and for a while it seemed as if not many state lawmakers would show up. As most of the 140 members of the House and Senate filed in, so did the press, spectators, and many others who came with Reverend Jackson. Commenting about the historical significance of his speech, Reverend Jackson said his presence was providential. To speak in these chambers is an act of reconciliation and healing. For your commitment to make the Alabama legislature a beacon of light and hope for the nation, you are to be highly commended. It is now time that we leave the battlegrounds behind us and seek a common ground and move to higher ground. He would only criticize U.S. industry for not reinvesting in America and in utilizing what he called slave labor from overseas. As his speech wound down, Reverend Jackson's delivery wound up and ended much like one of his sermons. He will raise all of us from disgrace to amazing grace. Thank you and God bless you. Reaction from lawmakers was mixed. Some said Reverend Jackson had some good points. Another said the whole thing was, quote, disgusting. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News at the Capitol. The two o'clock scheduled joint session was somewhat late in getting started and for a while it seemed as if not many state lawmakers would show up. As most of the 140 members of the House and Senate filed in, so did the press, spectators, and many others who came with Reverend Jackson. Commenting about the historical significance of his speech, Reverend Jackson said his presence was providential. To speak in these chambers is an act of reconciliation and healing. For your commitment to make the Alabama legislature a beacon of light and hope for the nation, you are to be highly commended. It is now time that we leave the battlegrounds behind us and seek a common ground and move to higher ground. He would only criticize U.S. industry for not reinvesting in America and in utilizing what he called slave labor from overseas. As his speech wound down, Reverend Jackson's delivery wound up and ended much like one of his sermons. He will raise all of us from disgrace 
to amazing grace. Thank you and God bless you. Reaction from lawmakers was mixed. Well, I think it turned into a tremendous media event for the man. There were some things in his speech that uh, I think that uh, were well taken, especially when he was talking about the economy and how it affects the South and, uh, and Alabama. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News at the Capitol. The county, even though the commission members are authorized by state law, vendor of the present system, uh, uh, we've determined that the uh, Chairman, this opinion deals with a correctional officer to provide overtime payments to the policemen involved holding full-time jobs. Third, it must the correctional officer had asked the vendor what it would cost. Does not have any such responsibility. Television coverage. Television coverage of this. Thank you. Man. When Mayor Emory right. Fallmark Good campaigned for governor last year, yeah. the city police officer was assigned to protect him. It cost the city yes, $3,000 sir. Hi, $65. I'm Emory Fallmark. How are you doing? I just want to put that angered city council member Mark Watkins, who challenged the practice the and asked the state ethics commission if the practice was unethical. The commission said today it was not. The absence of information that the mayor or his family, including his spouse or dependents, received any direct personal financial gain from these overtime payments to policemen, we find no violation of the ethics law. The commission also said in its opinion that Police Chief Charles Swindle assigned police protection to the mayor before he began campaigning due to threats on his life. The commission ruled Mayor Fulmer did not use his official position as mayor for financial gain and ruled that such security arrangements are common procedure. When the mayor became a candidate for a statewide office, the Department of Public Safety immediately notified him that under normal Alabama state legal procedure that the department would assign to him security officers. Also today it was reported to the commission that about 84 percent of all state, county, and city elected officials have filed this year's financial disclosure forms. The commission noted that number is much better than last year. Kim Davis, WSFA TV News at the State Ethics Commission. If you've told the retirement system that you're, you're full time. The Galloways, along with Montgomery physician David Dinerman and his wife Judith, were returning from a South Carolina vacation when the plane went down in a densely wooded area of Macon County. Mike Galloway was an executive with Blunt International for eight years. Company founder Wenton Blunt says Mr. Galloway made major contributions to the company as corporate treasurer. Today, co-workers at Blunt and personal friends met to pay their last respects. Mike and Gloria Galloway were described by Reverend William Dudley as parents who cared for their children and who also cared about Montgomery, as was evidenced by their civic and charitable contributions. Reverend Dudley told the mourners to burn the memory of the Galloways into their hearts and cherish that memory forever. Mike Carmack, WSFA TV News. Nine. How about you over southbound? CB radios, once a nationwide craze. Okie dokie, y'all looking good down there at 6585 split. But the number of requests for CB radio right operators' licenses has dropped range. dramatically since their heyday in 1976. That year, the Federal Communications Commission granted 5,087,000 CB licenses. Since then, the number has steadily declined to last year's all time low of only about a half million. Now the FCC has dropped the license requirement altogether. <laughs> I'd say 75 to 90 percent didn't have a license. But that doesn't necessarily so mean the number of CBs in use started, has dropped that much. Sam Morris has operated home run CBs for 15 years. Atlanta. Well, back right after the boom, the FCC come in and allowed 40 channels. We had 23 channels. When they uh, when they did, they say we're coming out with it. Say. Uh, January of 74. Well, they come out with it in uh, January of 73, and all of the, the big big companies, Browning, Tram, and all the different ones, were all stuck with 23-channel radio, which they had to unload. Though sales have dropped since the boom of the mid-70s, the repair business is still good. Sometimes we just don't have enough room in here. It's been quite busy some days. Uh, it comes and goes. You know, some days we get real busy, and some days it's slight for an hour or two. CBs are still being used by many of the same people who used them before the craze. 
farmers, businessmen, and truckers, who in general are happy to see the craze gone. It'd be okay if they used every other channel and left 19 alone. I think it's kind of a thing that, uh, you know, it goes into a phase like everything else does. I think it's petered out quite a bit already, you know. And where sales of CBs left off, sales of CB gadgets have gone wild. From noisemakers to power boosters to increase the CB range, they're selling like hotcakes. And incidentally, they're all illegal for CB use. So for those who are still using CBs, the latest FCC ruling has not had any great impact, in part because the FCC has never been able to control CB use as much as they'd like to, and because many CBers have never paid much attention to the FCC or their licenses in the first place. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News. The Biracial Advisory Council is Mayor Emery Fulmer's peace offering to black leaders, but he says it doesn't represent a change in his attitude. In my judgment at the moment, there is a perception of a problem of race relations in the city of Montgomery. Mayor Fulmer wants to work on perceptions, find out if problems between the black community and City Hall are real or imagined. Representative Alvin Holmes says Mayor Fulmer is the problem, a very real one, who will end up controlling the biracial council. And we need a biracial committee, but we don't need a biracial committee appointed by the mayor of the city of Montgomery. We need an independent biracial committee appointed outside of the mayor's office. I'm not opposed to dialogue, but I think it needs to be dialogue by and between individuals who can set the tone for this community. Councilman Watkins doesn't intend to make any appointments to the council and dismisses it as a political ploy. No, I view that as, as a symbolic political gesture to try to clean up his image uh, in the few weeks left before the city elections. We're going to set the committee up with or without uh, Mr. Reed or Mr. Watkins or anybody else. There are people of goodwill in this city who want to come together. But if black city council members don't participate, Mayor Fulmer's council of goodwill will be a limited one. Susan Silvernail, WSFA TV News. to the man who was uh, putting out some hay and uh, the tractor uh, caught fire from a backfire or he wasn't right sure but uh, uh, that in turn ignited some hay and it spread from there. Uh, we had uh, right near the loading dock we had a tank of diesel fuel and, that we used for our tractor and uh, it exploded after the fire reached that and that caused the, the fire to be more intense than it otherwise would have been. Ways and Means Committee didn't have the long day at plan. The idea of taking up the governor's proposed general fund budget was sidetracked yesterday when the House stalled on the last of the tax raising measures needed to see how much the money the lawmakers would have to spend in the general fund. Over on the Senate side, the Finance and Taxation Committee sidestepped all of the tax increase measures proposed by the governor and passed by the House in the last five weeks. Finance and Taxation instead passed a bill spending $300,000 to build an educational TV station on Mount Chihaw. The original tower on Mount Chihaw fell on the transmitter building in an ice storm last winter. Meanwhile, the governor's package of crime bills continued to tread water in the House Judiciary Committee. Two bills dealing with raising the legal drinking age to 21 and stiffening drunk driving penalties were discussed, but probably won't come up for a vote for a couple of weeks. Several major election bills did make it out of committee today. Both the Senate Governmental Affairs and House Constitution and Elections Committee passed similar versions of a bill updating the campaign disclosure forms. The form, the Secretary of State says, is a 1915 horse and buggy style, including an obviously unenforced provision that doesn't allow TV advertising in political campaigns. The bill is also designed to force candidates to reveal their contributions before an election. 
Other provisions of the bill require a candidate to qualify before raising any contributions and forces municipal candidates to come under the disclosure law. The House committee version enacts the law immediately, which means it could be used for the special legislative elections this fall. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA-TV News at the Capitol. The Senate Governmental Affairs Committee has approved a bill that would set up a five-member panel to oversee elections. The bill, sponsored by Senator Jim Smith of Huntsville, would also require candidates to tell where they get their money and how they're spending it before the election instead of afterward. The committee also approved a change in state primary elections from September to June. A similar campaign disclosure bill made it out of the House Constitution and Elections Committee. The House bill updates the form candidates file. Secretary of State Don Sigelman characterized the present form as 1915 horse and buggy style. Members of the Senate Finance and Taxation Committee didn't discuss any of the governor's tax increase bills. Instead, the Money Committee made arrangements to give some money to state public television. If the bill becomes law, APTN will receive $300,000 to replace a transmitting facility on Mount Cheeha, destroyed last January during a vicious winter storm. Those who want a bill out of the House Judiciary Committee to increase the legal drinking age to 21 were disappointed. That bill and another to stiffen drunk driving penalties were postponed for the third week in a row. Both bills are in Governor Wallace's crime package. The House Ways and Means Committee didn't take much time to take care of business. Discussion of the general fund budget was put off because the full House has failed to pass the last of Governor Wallace's tax raising measures. Passing that bill means lawmakers will have more money to spend in the general fund budget. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News at the Capitol. What did you think about the movie? I thought it was excellent. It was, I thought it was a well done show. It was, uh, I thought it was great for the kids and great for the adults. What's your favorite part in the movie? Uh, I think when Leah told, when Han told Leah, I love you, and she said, I know. She got him back from the Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> Like 50 more times. <laughs> so you've seen Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back? All of them, 12 times. Get the gun! Point at the deck! It was meant to follow a three-act play. In Act One, you introduce the characters and the environment. Vader's on that ship. Now, don't get jittery, Luke. There are a lot of command ships. In Act Two, you develop the problems and usually it has tragic overtones. I have no memory of my mother. I never knew her. And then Act Three is the big finish. With the score tied at one in the fourth inning, Ellis Valentine knocked in a pair with a ground rule double to right field. Angels on top, 3-1. to one. Then Bob Boone lined one up the middle. That brought Valentine around, and California had a 4-1 to one lead. Trailing 4-2 in the eighth, Yankees tied it on Oscar Gamble's two-run homer to center off reliever Luis Sanchez. And then Juan Espino bounced one over the mound. Shortstop Tim Foley made a good grab but could not get Don Baylor at the plate. Yanks on top, 5-4. Fred Lynn tied the ball game in the eighth with a home run to left field, and it was 5-5. Then with two down in the top of the tenth, Roy Smalley took his turn, homer to center off Mike Witt, and it was 6-5 Yankees. In the bottom of the inning with two men aboard, Ellis Valentine lined the ball to Oscar Gamble in right. Gamble claimed he lost it in the lights and then was handcuffed. Lynn scored, and it was six apiece. Then Bobby Gritch gave Gamble another chance out in right field. Tough play. Oscar came in, dove, dropped the ball. Pinch runner Rick Adams scored. The Angels had a 7-6 extra inning win. But uh, no, I can't imagine uh, why a few of our players weren't picked. I can't imagine a better quarterback in the country, much less the SEC, than Walter Lewis. Certainly there's not a better receiver than Joey Jones or Jesse Bendris uh, and people like those. Uh, John Hand, of course, he's a 
he's an incoming sophomore, he's a freshman that played a little bit last year. Uh, I can understand some of those young players, but certainly Walter Lewis and the two receivers, you know, I, I can't understand how they missed. Do you think this might have something to do with a new program and it's kind of a wait and see attitude? Well, it could be, but it, uh, to me, the young, the young people, those young men shouldn't suffer because of that. They've already proven themselves. Uh, they aren't technical. It's simply a student that was caught with possession of marijuana that gets 10 years. His campaign, he promised the victims' rights movement. Our population today, that, that is the number of inmates sentenced to the state, is a little over 9,000. 1,500 of these are backed up in our county and city jails which were never equipped or uh, built to handle long-term type inmates. And in effect, what it's doing today is breaking many counties. We also have our West Jefferson facility that is sleeping in the halls in definitely unconstitutional environments. For us, the taxpayers, a hundred and fifty, little over a hundred and fifty thousand dollars to house that person. And we wanted to bring this to the attention of the board today because you may have community action agencies in your district. I the board that this would be essentially no money at all in terms of operating our PBA area um, and or North Alabama that we serve. Resolution in the material. Um, TVA has been negotiating through uh, Mr. Marseille's office. The basic requirements for participation are that the organization be a non-profit agency, child care institutions, 28 summer camps. These foods can be made available to eligible cooperative emergency feeding organizations without cost, to the extent that they are used without waste. As I said earlier, this means that many as three meals a day can be made available <coughs> to eligible persons. Residential child care institutions, 28 summer camps. We just want to make sure that we do all we can to make that they do know it's available. Um, I don't think that's the only problem, frankly. I think that's just one. Well, obviously, we have some agencies that could do this if for some reason not doing it. I don't know what the reasons are. Nobody's given me a reason. Uh, so I wouldn't. The Faith Rescue Mission is the only agency in Montgomery so far to sign up for the free food recently okayed by Congress. The food comes in part from surplus USDA stock and will help here where the mission already has its own food program underway. We're feeding about 16 now for, for, for breakfast and uh, 16 in the afternoon for supper. Uh, we feed our employees lunch only right now. Um, hopefully we can get into to another program where we can feed them at lunchtime. The mission has been relying on church support and private donations to operate its free food program for people who are poor, unemployed, or transient. It would be a tragedy for us not to utilize this food helping the needy in our state. State officials are hoping more nonprofit organizations like the Faith Rescue Mission will join the free food program. Meanwhile, the people at the mission are hoping the same thing. Uh, it's needed in this area, uh, all over Montgomery, because uh, you'd be surprised people call you. I had a woman call me last night at 1030. I want some food for her children. These folks walking around these streets today that are hungry and need, to, need food. If Alabama does not use its allotment by September, it will lose it. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News. First 1981, you didn't get it, and uh, we'll have to try to catch you on the next one. We need leaders to guide you in the months ahead. We need it all happened in Alabama. They and they will continue to work on these programs. Well, uh, at the current legislation, we're looking for a cost of living raise for our beneficiaries. And we're working on a program to try to get the state to pay our insurance, monthly insurance, Blue Cross, for the retirees. We also have a bill in to obtain a position on the insurance board 
for the Alabama state employees, active employees, mm -hmm. which would give us representation there. All of the funds that we receive from membership at all levels of leadership, look around, think a minute, and let's nominate a provisional president of the Southeast Montgomery ARSEA. Who will it be? Look around, think a minute, and let's nominate a provisional president of the Southeast Montgomery House. Standing a publicist here today, Bill Bray. But how many times have you heard anything about people going down? Well, we would like to have a membership of 8,000, 8 to 10,000 in five years from now. We have a potential at the present time of 12,000 people that are eligible to join this on Saturday. And we're over 3,000 strong now. So we, we have hopes of being able to get a free cup of coffee. I work for you. They travel, they go to other and advance an association in every way. They started the association with some of you because we have a number of charter members in the audience today. All this uh, hoop and holler and baloney, as I like to call it, is what that's all it is, political rhetoric. That the, that the crime rate's gonna go up because Fred Smith put 87 property offenders in Jefferson County. Uh, that's all that is, is political rhetoric. Commissioner Smith says politicians are good a at training the fears the of the, of the year, public to enact and we're hoping to expand these industrial programs. To People want to see corruption is Commissioner not the Smith answer. Says this has to end. Our population today, that, that is the number of inmates sentenced to the state, there's a little over 9,000. 1,500 of these are backed up in our county and city jails, which were never equipped or uh, built to handle long-term type inmates. And in effect, what it's doing today is breaking many counties. The commissioner says the supervised restitution program designed to get inmates out of jail and on the job is working like a charm. He says programs like this one are the answers to our overcrowding problems. And by the 1st of July, we should see the proof. Gina Gregory, WSFA, TV News. It's simply political. And that is, politicians for too long in the state have been going. And these people that are pushing for lethal injection today simply don't know what they're talking about. They haven't done the research, uh, and they haven't talked to any other states that have the lethal injection. The body fights uh, the lethal injections in some horrible manner. The person does go to sleep, but we're told that up to 15 to 20 minutes, the body goes into convulsions, uh, coughing, and fighting this. And it's certainly not uh, as humane as the electric chair is, and we have several psych psychiatrists that are going to testify in court uh, one June uh, that with 90, I believe it's 90 volts they use with shock treatment on temples of, a, of the head, a person is immediately unconscious. How long can we continue this madness? The I've got a the document here prepared franchise by tax increase has been ongoing for more than two weeks. The last Today, the leadership dollars. came up with its third and we'll final version of the, the increase, uh, in the generating more than seven million size. new dollars. Mr. That's Speaker, down from the more than eight million in the last version and the fourteen uh, million in the original bill. This bill has been discussed at great length, and I think it needs a little more discussion. But a dwindling opposition Enhance continued to jab at the administration and again place. accused of the playing Bring a shell game by trying to hide a tax increase jobs. under the name of a revenue enhancement. I don't see any hope because every time I turn around, another business tax, another tax on the consumer, another tax on individuals is on this floor. I haven't gotten any word from any person with this administration that we're going to bother to slow down. So let's hold our foot down and say no more. Let's start protecting the people who put us into office. $250 million per year, $70 for every man, woman, and child in this state, and new tax increases. That, that part of the problems that we have are that we're going to have some new expenditures which we have not had in previous budgets, one of which, just by itself, is going to be about equal to the revenue that's going to be raised by this proposed bill, and that's a new prison in St. Clair County. The administration was able to hang on to its committed votes passing the bill. 
for the This vote. is the last major tax increase measure the Wallace administration wants to make ends meet in its proposed general fund budget. Senator now the tax bill Speaker, moves on to the Senate to Budget Committee, where the other ten substitute. enhancement bills have been bottlenecked for the last Please month. Mr. Chris Speaker. Grimshaw, WSFA TV Mr. News Mr. in the House of Representatives. I don't know what's in Mr. Payne's substitute. This is the fifth week the Senate has spent considering the new Constitution. On Tuesday, an amendment was offered that would have allowed constitutional officers like the governor and attorney general to receive cost of living raises during their terms. The present Constitution prohibits that. The amendment was tabled or killed. Senator Ted Little of Auburn, who opposed the amendment, was afraid that some senators might have changed their minds and would try to reconsider that action. So Senator Little started a filibuster to eat up time until noon when Senate rules prohibit a reconsideration, or so he thought. As it turned out, the vote which tabled or killed the amendment couldn't be voted on again anyway. The next flurry of activity came Utah after Senator Donald Holmes of Oxford proposed an amendment that would mandate education as an essential function of state government. A motion was made to table the amendment. The vote was a 12-12 tie. Okay. Lieutenant Governor Bill Baxley, who only votes in the case of a tie, had to choose a side. He voted against tabling and, uh, the amendment and against the bill's sponsor, Ryan DeGraffenreid of Tuscaloosa. Uh, However, later, on a straight vote, the amendment was defeated. The Senate adjourned without passing the Constitution. Dennis Latham, WSFA-TV News, at the Capitol. Um, TVA has been negotiating through, uh, who advised the board, that this would be essentially retraining. Debated. And the agencies can provide up to three meals per day. And we criticize quite often, but our board chairman, I think, <laughs> See the man from Sneak here. Bill Osborne and uh, Charles. Skills training is done. The C program today. And the high technology that, that would come with it, if, if, if college courses developed out of it, they would have to be submitted. The program would be to you for approval. So really, it's, it's not. See the man from Sneak here. Bill Osborne and. Uh, no funds, no money at all in terms of. And non credit at this point. No, that's correct. It was strictly the I say, would you like to uh, elaborate? It is debated. And the agencies can provide up to three meals per day. And as you look, uh, see on the. gift by Mrs. John W. Overton of Montgomery for the construction of an auditorium for the School of Veterinary Medicine. This is just one among many news conferences Dr. Billy has held across the state in the past several months. And while the Generations Fund is important to Auburn, Dr. Billy has also used his time before reporters to talk about the problems Auburn is facing. Following the news conference, Dr. You know, Dr. Billy said his meetings are by design. He doesn't pull any punches either. But he says the problems Auburn and other premier universities in the state are facing is due to the lack of funding by the legislature. It's not pleasant, and uh, it, it's not going to win a popularity contest for me, I'm sure. I feel compelled to say some of these things, though, because I believe sincerely that if this state is to prosper in the future, more of the additional funds that can be made available must be targeted to the comprehensive universities. University of Alabama and Auburn University because these have the capability of doing the research and providing the graduate training so urgently needed in the state. Dr. Bailey admits his role as interim president gives him an opportunity to speak his mind that might not be afforded well, a permanent president. Unusual position Dr. Bailey, who's been at the helm of Auburn for nearly three months, career. says he has no desire to seek a position years. permanently. Sure. In fact, I think I'm more convinced of that than I was on March 1. Don Phelps, WSFA TV News. There's a great deal of pressure, a great deal of stress. That's inevitable, even under the best of circumstances. The Hurricanes have not had a national championship type of year, finishing the season 59 and 19. They look at the Southern Regional as a chance to make amends. 
and despite facing a strong Alabama squad in the opening game, most of the Miami players look forward to meeting their arch rivals. Florida State. They uh, pitch us real tough and they hit real good. Uh, but we really want Florida State. That's the thing. Uh, these guys have got the top hitter in the nation Alabama has, and uh, he's just another player to me. So everybody's motivated, and, and we're out for revenge, and this is our chance to do it. Alabama is playing for a national championship for the first time in 15 years. Are they intimidated by facing the Hurricanes? Apparently so, not. Uh, I don't think we're intimidated. I think we're anxious to get ready and you know, go over there and get started. Get thinking how good they are, but... They're just as, no better than Florida State or us or South Alabama. I think we can get down there and beat them. You know, it's going to be an exciting point of defending champs, but, uh, you know, just get down and approach like any other game. Alabama faces Miami at 1 o'clock local time tomorrow in Tallahassee. Florida State and South Alabama follow at 6. Rick Pons, WSFA TV Sports. Alabama's hitman this season has been David Magadan. The Tampa, Florida native has been nothing short of incredible since bursting on the Bama baseball scene three years ago. As a freshman, he hit 389. As a sophomore, he improved to 395 and became the school's career leader in five offensive categories. But this season, he did the unbelievable, leading all collegiate hitters with a 543 average. I worked real hard in the offseason as far as weights and, and running every day. And, you know, I felt like I can hit higher than I did the last couple of years, but I, I didn't realize I can hit as high as I am right now. I'm just, I'm not taking it. I didn't look at it at the beginning of the year as having a goal. I just went up there and, and uh, took one at bat at a time, and, you know, everything went right for me. Yeah, he's just having a an unbelievable year. He's always been a good hitter, Rick, uh, but he's just having a great year this year, and I, I don't know what else to say. It's not just one or two games. You know, he's got a, over 200 plate appearances, so it's not a, a, a situation where he hadn't batted that often for the averages to level off. He just doesn't level off. He just got on a tear about a month and a half ago and has just kept increasing that batting average. Such a phenomenal hitting performance has had the Major League Scouts drooling over the tied first baseman. The question is, will he forego his senior season and take a pro offer? David refuses to speculate on his pro future. His only concern now is seeing Alabama make it to the College World Series. I'm worried about our team goals right now. And, uh, you know, I'll just think about that when the time comes. When, when the draft is here, I'll, I'll make my decision then. I haven't really made my decision yet. Uh, David knows that if the money's right, his bargaining power and everything is in his favor now. He really probably will sign if the money's right. Magadan will lead the Tide in the opening round of the Southern Regional tomorrow in Tallahassee. Alabama opens against defending national champion Miami. More on that tonight at 10. Rick Ponce, WSFA TV Sports. Her case is a rare and sensitive one. Fanny, as she is called, is severely retarded, and she hasn't told doctors much more than that. She hasn't given them vital information like where she lives or her full name, mainly because she can't. I feel more and more talking with her and other people that have been with her since Friday morning that she was just put out in Talladega and left with uh, a paper sack. One thing about her is obvious. She is afraid of men. She would immediately become withdrawn, close her eyes, and look away from that man. Doctors would like to help this girl by finding a foster home and placing her in special classes, but they desperately need information about her true identity. She needs to be in a daycare program so she can learn different uh, self-help skills that she does not have at this time. Anyone with information on this young woman should contact the Chiha Mental Health Center anytime, day or night. Doctors say the biggest help would be her full name. As Joanna said, this is an exciting time for 
I want to. I've been um, paying attention to what I've heard about the city. I've seen how the board works, and I've certainly worked with the orchestra some. And everything is going together. I feel very, very good about next year. Everything seems to be coming together in, in the city of Montgomery. Hey, Randall. Hey, Randall. Good to see you. Hey, John. How are you? How are you, sir? Hey, Howard. Good to see you. Good to see you. 